do insects have emotions? Charles Turner did at least take this possibility seriously. I invite you all to read the papers of this man. He lived from 1867 to 1923. He was a, an entomologist as well as a psychologist and his literature is extremely rich with visionary ideas that unfortunately have been largely forgotten today. But it's remarkable also that he actually did consider the possibility of these digger wasps having emotions. So this is a photograph by him from one of his papers in 1912. And he writes this, the coiled antenna, the protruding mouth parts, and the general attitude indicate intense excitement. One who believes that insects have emotions will find much in the attitude of these two Ammophilas to support his view. Now, Turner was aware that this was merely an observation. It was not an experimental exploration. He has very rigorous experiments in many of his other papers, which I would strongly encourage you to read. Now, the alternative view that insects do not have any kind of emotions or are capable of suffering is epitomized in this website here, which um, advertises the commercial availability of live insects for electrophysiological experiments for laymen. So this website, Backyard Brains, cheerfully announces that we are excited to announce the world's first commercially available cyborg. With our Roboroach, you can briefly wirelessly control the left-right right movements of a cockroach by microstimulation of the antennal nerves. In a biologically relevant example, the traditional view of insects as reflex automatons or philosophical, philosophical zombies is encapsulated in this image here, where the traditional view holds that even though you can see the, the, the bee in, that's freshly been caught in a spider web struggling and trying to get away, is that this is merely a hardwired program to, designed to facilitate escape, but that the bee actually feels nothing or foresees um, not the, the kind of uh, potentially disastrous scenario that is about to materialize. And to explore this a little further, um, I'll show you a little video from a French television channel about our explorations of the possibility of emotions in insects. It was even thought that animals like bees, other insects, do not even have basic nociception. That is a, a more reflex-like response to um, a potentially an injuring or a potentially injuring stimulus. So there are classic reports uh, or, or quotations, for example, by a Nobel laureate, Carl von Frisch, who claimed that when a bee is happily sucking nectar, you can take a pair of scissors and cut off her abdomen and she won't even respond to that stimulus. So the claim there was that not even that they don't have pain, but they don't even have a reflex-like response to a damaging stimulus. That, of course, is nonsense. So anyone who's ever witnessed, say, an insect, a grasshopper, um, or indeed an, a, a, an earthworm being impaled on a fishing hook will know that they resist that sort of treatment with the same kind of vigor that a human being might when they're impaled on a, on a hook. So clearly there is basic nociception. That you can measure um, the extent to which an animal tries to get away from a potentially harmful stimulus. It's interesting to know that the stimulus for, or one stimulus for bees to engage in such attacks is alarm pheromone. So if their hive is attacked, some of the bees will register that and spread a scent in the air um, that tells other bees there's a threat, um, we're, we're under attack, um, and which provokes other bees to counterattack and to find the, the potential threat. So what people have found um, is that uh, if bees are exposed to this alarm pheromone, they're actually less likely to deliver, to have a pain-like response. So they seem to be flooding their system with an endogenous painkiller as a result of smelling the alarm pheromone, which of course is indicative that there is some sort of awareness of a threat of injury, but that this um, awareness and the potential 
um, fear associated with it is ameliorated by an endogenous substance um, that functions as a painkiller. Lars Chitka is specialized in bumblebee behavior. His team is trying to understand the cognitive capacities of this insect. Okay, welcome to the bee lab. You can see some young scientists in action, as well as some bees learning things. The nest naturally would be in a cavity in an abundant mouse hole, for example, um, where a single queen starts a nest in spring and then starts to lay eggs and um, raise their young. And once she has some workers of her own, they will take on the foraging activities. And the, the tunnel is the equivalent of the mouse hole tunnel in the natural world. And these boxes are what we call our flight arenas. That's where we present them with various types of artificial flowers and puzzle boxes which the bees then have to learn about. Here, the bees learn to count, manipulate simple objects, and solve puzzles. It turns out they are incredibly intelligent. Not only are they capable of finding solutions, but also transmitting them to their peers so they can learn too. During one of their scientific studies, the team made an astonishing finding. So we began um, becoming interested in the subject in a study where we exposed bees to simulated spider attacks. So the prediction for a reflex-like robotic um, insect pollinator would be, okay, if they get attacked by a spider, then of course they register that attack and try to get away, but that ends there. But what we found instead was an indication that the bees' whole behavior changed after such a crab spider attack in that they don't didn't just fly away from the flower but they would then subsequently um, fly more slowly and inspect every flower very carefully before landing on the flowers and this behavior change lasted for more than 24 hours after an attack so there was a long lasting behavior change but moreover they didn't just inspect the flowers for longer but they also behaved as if they were seeing ghosts. So often they inspected the flower, and even if there was no crab spider hidden on it, they'd fly away again, as if they thought, oh, this doesn't look quite safe. And that was already an indication of there being long-lasting behavior changes as a result of a scary experience which is more equivalent to an emotion-like state in vertebrates or humans um, than the predictions that would arise from just a reflex-like robotic um, behavior. There's no way to judge emotions objectively, even in other humans. So all we can do is measure a variety of observable behavioral responses that would be indicative of emotional states in us, but the, the, the judgment is always an indirect one. But the more evidence we can accumulate from both psychology and behavior, as well as physiology, neural stages, hormonal stages, um, then of course the more comprehensive a picture we get on the potential emotion-like states. Finally, some broader conclusions that there are sorts of emotional states, at least by the same criteria as we diagnose them in large brain mammals, that there are emotional states that, um, that we can diagnose and that we should perhaps explore whether there are even emotions that we don't know in other animals, such as that might be linked to unique bee minds, unique bee problems, such as the discovery of a nectar-rich flower or the swarming process when honeybees move from one hive to the next. And finally, I think it's important to consider the ethical implications of such research, um, the possibility that there is a mind, and possibly suffering in bees, and I think that is important for how we consider their conservation, as well as thinking about how we treat animals in research laboratories.